Price predictions, they're quite fruitless because you're pricing a finitely scarce asset and an infinitely printable currency. So then you're talking about infinity divided by 21 million. Infinity divided by any number is infinity. Bitcoin has proven to be over its first 15 years the best transfer of value across time in the long run. And because fiat falls short in the area of transferring value effectively over time, that makes it vulnerable to being replaced. The final domino would be global unit of account. So everything is priced in Bitcoin. We're about Bitcoin reaching 100k, which I view as an inevitability within the next 12 months, and then you're talking about Bitcoin reaching, you know, 250k or so to where Satoshi Nakamoto, the owner of about 1.1 million Bitcoins, then becomes the richest person in the world. Their lives are literally being stolen from them because of the inflationary nature of the US dollar and all fiat currencies. It breaks the chain between central banks and citizens, and it frees citizens as a result. Then you're talking about the free market being unleashed because we're united on free money. We're united on a standard measurement of value that can never be manipulated and that can be understood anywhere in the world on a global, digital, immutable level. And that's protected from any manipulation or centralized evil authorities. Now I've noticed in the past couple of weeks or months, the, the price predictions got more. <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> I don't know if you also noticed that, um, but I've also seen that you had, I just researched quickly and I saw like you, some articles. I didn't even know if this is an, um, a recent article of yours, um, but as a general question, do you think that um, price predictions in itself is, is just a good marketing tool or do you think that hmm. Uh, price predictions also like the power law we have the plan uh, the stock to flow like there are so many different models to go there is it yeah. does this serve a bigger picture a bigger purpose or is it just like marketing yeah it's a really good question i think price predictions ultimately are fruitless but i think price also is the ultimate signal for bitcoiners and not not necessarily bitcoiners but bitcoin adoption and people coming onto the market and becoming Bitcoiners. Like if you were to take the Bitcoin price completely out of the equation, how would you even value it then? And then what would be the signal of Bitcoin's value and how would it be represented? Okay, this is the best performing asset ever. If there wasn't any price to represent that, then we would have really no signal for it. Price predictions, again, I think they're quite fruitless because you're pricing a finitely scarce asset and an infinitely printable currency. So then you're talking about infinity divided by 21 million and infinity divided by any number is infinity. So I think, and I've written about that before on Twitter, that's really the ultimate mathematical price model is just infinity divided by 21 million. And then you get out of, okay, stop pricing Bitcoin in US dollars or euros, Argentinian pesos, whatever it is. And you start pricing it in all of the world's productivity. Well, that number is also infinite. And as any hardcore Bitcoin knows, then you're talking about the true value of Bitcoin, which is infinity divided by 21 million, because Bitcoin will be global money and it'll price in all of the world's productivity. And then you get an infinite value assigned to all of Bitcoin. What about uh, pricing Bitcoin in how many houses you can buy or how many ounces of gold you can buy? Is that make, sure. Does this make more sense? Yeah, I think it makes more sense. What can I go out and exchange my Bitcoin for? At the end of the day, that's what we're using Bitcoin for. It's great to hold it, but if we can't go out and exchange it for anything, it's not serving its purpose as money. It can store value over time, great, but if then we have to go and exchange it for something else, then it becomes a little bit vulnerable to being replaced because then it doesn't transfer value over space or scales, which is what money is used for, which is what Bitcoin's main aim is. So if you can price Bitcoin in houses and say, well, this house was worth 20 Bitcoins five years ago and is worth two Bitcoins today. And let's say you had 20 Bitcoins five years ago and you saved up. Well, now you can buy 10 houses or you can just buy the one and have Bitcoin left over. And this is getting into actually what savings is supposed to be used for. It's allowed, it's supposed to allow you to plan for your future effectively, which I've written about recently on Twitter. Hmm. Ah, oh, interesting. Do you, do you see, uh, I mean, obviously you see Bitcoin as, as the best store of value. Do you mm -hmm. also see it as, as uh, long term as like the best currency, as the best medium of exchange? Yeah, certainly. I think really the space and scales part, because money is the 
good asset, whatever you want to call it, that transfers value the most effectively across space, scales, and time. And space would be, okay, I take it from Puerto Rico to Austria. I take it from the United States to Africa, wherever it is. I want to take my money with me so that I can participate in the economy no matter where I'm at. Okay. And then scales is, okay, I want to buy a house, but I also want to buy a pack of gum. Can I use money to group it together to buy the house? Can I divide it down to buy the pack of gum? We've really solved the space and scales part already with digital money in its current form in the US dollar. We can divide it just with, you know, a couple of taps on a keyboard with, with uh, fiat. But the issue with fiat is transferring value over time. And that's where Bitcoin comes in and Bitcoin is proven to be over its first 15 years, the best transfer of value across time in the long run. And because fiat falls short in the area of transferring value effectively over time, that makes it vulnerable to being replaced by a currency, a good, a monetary asset that does transfer it effectively over time. Because logically, any market participant wants to transfer their value effectively over time. If they go out and expend 40 hours in a week and they get paid let's say $100, but then that $100 becomes worth $90 next year, or they can get paid in $100 worth of Bitcoin, let's call it one Bitcoin for convenience sake, and then the Bitcoin appreciates to $110 worth, well, you're going to take the one that appreciates your value more over time, logically. And so we're seeing that play out, and because Bitcoin is digital, it solves the space and scales problem, and it's also you know decentralized, and there's many other factors to it as well that protects those properties, but it's really solving the transfer of value over time. And that's ultimately why it'll replace the dollar and any other currency, because it is the best transfer of value over time because of its finite scarce properties and because of the decentralized secure properties of the network that protect those properties. I, I like a lot those um, comparisons, the historical comparison of like how new technology um, replaced uh, old technology when we have like from uh, landlines to cell phones, when yeah, we have yeah. like from horses to cars, like all those things, they all kind of follow the similar S curve adoption. Uh, and I mean, everyone is well aware of that, like the internet also. Um, do, do you see that? Like the timing is always really interesting and, and, and it's also the hardest to predict yeah. uh, um, and to look out in the future when you look out like maybe five years, then, okay, look out <laughs> like 10, 15 years. Uh, on the one side, we have like this, this is this feared uh, monster, this feared thing that's kind of really bad, but like everyone sh still uses it and there's right. still a monopoly on it. Um, what's your current uh, s status of, of feared when you would like, maybe let's do this. Um, if you think of fiat as a human being and a human being at, at some point just dies, yeah, um, yeah. How, how far, how far is that human being? Uh, is it like 50 years old? Is it like 70 years old? What, what, what would you say is the, the current mental and uh, health status of, uh, of fiat? Well, let's say, well, the, the way I like to try to predict quote unquote Bitcoin adoption is with a normal distribution curve because you're talking about fiat that's existed officially for 53 years now, but really the manipulation of money has existed for much longer. The Federal Reserve officially enacted in 1913, but money was still being manipulated prior to prior to that plenty. So you're talking about a monetary system that's been entrenched for quite some time versus a monetary system that started from literal zero with Bitcoin 15 years ago in 2009. So it's not going to happen overnight, but again, the way I like to think about when the kind of shift plays out in terms of Bitcoin becoming global money and replacing the dollar as a reserve currency and really replacing all fiat currencies is with that normal distribution curve. And so my far left tail end, which would be the quickest for Bitcoin to be adopted, I would put as 2027. I think you're starting to see some political discussions already with U.S. presidential candidates, i.e. Trump, that are supporting Bitcoin because, you know, Trump, Bitcoin doesn't need Trump, but Trump needs Bitcoin. And you're going to see political candidates start to increasingly understand 
that they need Bitcoin if they want to get elected to office, which is the name of the game for politicians. They like getting elected. So they're going to continue to pander to Bitcoiners. And especially because Bitcoiners are single issue voters, i.e. they want money separated from state, which is what Bitcoin does. They're only going to vote for the candidates that support their beliefs. And so you're going to see an increasing amount of politicians that do that. Already. So you're already seeing that. And it could be as quick as 2027. Again, that's far left tail end for me. I would say far right tail end in terms of the slowest would be something like maybe 25 years from now. We'll call it 2050. I'd be really, really stunned if it took basically 40 years for Bitcoin to be adopted because technology is compounding exponentially and the internet took much less longer to reach basically 60% adoption. And, and that's really most of the civilized world. And as technologies continue to spread and the internet becomes more accessible in remote locations, then people have a greater access to Bitcoin, which is leveraging the internet. So if it took another 25 years, that would really stun me. But my kind of middle third of the distribution, which is where I think the most likely chance, the most likely time frame is for Bitcoin to be adopted would be about 10 to 15 years. So I'd say 2034 to 2039 is kind of that time frame, which would put fiat as a human being, let's say the average life expectancy. Well, the average life expectancy of fiat, I believe is about 50 years, somewhere around that number. And we're at 53 right now. So technically it's already past due, but under the normal distribution curve model that I, that I like to use, it gives it about a 10, 15 year lifespan, but it, it could all happen so quickly because you're talking about a debt spiral that we're in right now. That's in an immensely negative feedback loop. That's only continuing to get worse. And it's not a United States issue. It's a global issue with all of these debt based currencies. So it could happen, you know, overnight. Some people like to say it could happen the way you fall asleep slowly then all at once. I think that makes sense too. It's interesting because 2035 would also be the moment when I'm not mistaken, where 99% of all Bitcoin supply would be mined. So like there's like yeah, there's yeah. Some, some significance there uh, would be interesting to see. Then the last 1% takes like a hundred years. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, w would be an interesting time. W what do you mean with like when Bitcoin gets adopted? Like what, what does this mean? It's like fiat that <coughs> and we all use Bitcoin to transact or uh, what, what does it mean that Bitcoin is fully adopted? Yeah. Fully adopted for me, the, the final domino would be global unit of account. So everything is priced in Bitcoin, houses, cars, gallons of milk, food, whatever it is that you're paying. Everything is priced in Bitcoin. Everything is denominated in Bitcoin all over the world. That would be the final unit. Of, that would be the final domino would be the unit of account. And that would come shortly after becoming the global medium of exchange. And I think I came across this idea, I believe on Twitter a few weeks ago where Someone mentioned the possibility or that maybe they were clamoring for the idea for countries and really the world as a human species to come together and kind of sign on to a constitution-esque style of document that just declares Bitcoin is money for the world and everyone kind of signs on to that, which I thought was interesting. Something that kind of it's akin to the Declaration of Independence where we're separating from King George, the manipulators, the scammers, the ones that are debasing our money and taxing us to oblivion, et cetera, et cetera. And so we kind of declare away from that and unite along this monetary standard, which I think is it's a cool idea. That's a really cool idea. I mean, 2035, uh, it, it seems very aggressive for me, <laughs> yeah. but at, at the same time, I'm like this, this, this fiat system is like, it, 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 it existed so long already, like this 50 year, it, it, um, like right. every year we are not in hyperinflation and we're not uh, at, uh, people in the street demonstrating against the federal reserve. It, it fascinates me that, that we are <laughs> still not there. Like when I thought, when I saw everything coming together in, in, in like 2020 where with, with COVID and everything, I was like, oh, yeah, like in one, two, maximum three years, we, we have massive uh, strikes on the streets and we will have massive hyperinflation. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of amazed that we don't have it till now. Well, I think a big part of it is because the dollar 
is the kingpin and it is the global reserve currency. They being the U.S., let's just call it the U.S. monetary system. They have the benefit of exporting their dollars and in their inflation to other countries. And that really is the greatest export of the United States is the dollar. Whereas you take a country like Argentina that prints their country to oblivion, prints their country, prints their money to oblivion, that, that all of those pesos, we'll call them dollars, they stay within that country. They don't get exported out and used elsewhere. And so they feel the effects uh, much harder than American citizens would just in the country because those dollars in the States are sent to Honduras. They're sent to Mexico. They're sent all over the world, Cayman Islands, wherever it is. And because of that, we don't necessarily feel it as much. But if you go to other countries, their their economies are getting destroyed by inflation because they can't circulate their printed money outside of their country. So it's it's a harsh reality for the states, but it's the best reality out of all the fiat currencies, but it's harsh all the way around, really. It's, it's, um, and, and there's also like, uh, it, it, there's a lot of interesting things here because, um, that's, it's very true that, for example, in the states or even like in <coughs> Europe, it's, it's kind of inflation is kind of in control. Like, uh, right. I don't go into the supermarket and I'm like, oh shit, the prices are massively rising. Like, you don't notice it if you don't look exactly in there. But then there are also countries like not that far away from me, like Turkey. Uh, Turkey has like an official fla inflation rate of over 100%. So yeah. the inofficial is probably like 200% or maybe even above that. It depends on, on what metrics you're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they, they are still not like, uh, I mean, they're probably more inclined to Bitcoin. And, uh, but, uh, I, I talked with, I think like two or three people already from Turkey on the podcast. Uh, and, and they're going towards like uh, gold and, 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 and land and <laughs> whatever, like the, those kind of things. Why even in, in those countries to, the, the, what do we need to do that, that people get Bitcoin? Like, is, is it just like time and, and, and will, will that actually be done? Because th there's like two hearts in me. Like the, f the one heart is like, oh, it will be so quick. Like we have mm -hmm. the, in the internet and it's so obvious. Once you get it, you're really quick. Uh, me, it took me like one year from Bitcoin is a scam to I'm all in Bitcoin. Like this <laughs> transformation took like one year for me. Um, and it's just like a bunch of podcasts, books, anything like that. So I'm like, yeah, we, I can see it in like five, 10 years that we are really quick at this adoption rate. But then I also look at, uh, friends and families and, and even like people in Turkey that I talk to that they hear about Bitcoin since like five, six years all over again. And they're always like, ah, oh, it's expensive and all, all those weird things. Um, yeah, yeah. it's, there, there are a lot of thoughts uh, around that. Like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, there are a lot of thoughts there. I think time is certainly the greatest tool for adoption in terms of it's just going to take time, right? It, just like the internet was around in the early 90s and many people weren't aware about it. And, and still even 15 years later, 2005, 2006, it's around. But it compared to today, it looks completely antiquated. So it, it'll take time. And that's when it comes back to price being the ultimate signal. You're talking about Bitcoin reaching 100K, which I view as inevitability within the next 12 months. Okay, that's that's a signal. And then you're talking about Bitcoin reaching, you know, 250K or so, along with the increase in other asset prices to where Satoshi Nakamoto, the ownership, the owner of about 1.1 million Bitcoins then becomes the richest person in the world. Well, that's pretty significant as well. Along with the continued calamity of fiat currencies and their governments, let's say, let's say Trump adopts Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset to any amount, literally buys 10 Bitcoins with it. Well, then you're talking about game theory. Other countries like El Salvador have already gotten there and they've reaped the benefits and are continuing to. And then other countries will start to adopt. So this is where you get that gradually, then suddenly that really uh, hockey stick moment. And then a country starts printing their own money to buy, to buy Bitcoins. And you're talking about things that can happen really fast and then it becomes a scramble, but it's all theoretical and it's, it's hard to know for sure how it plays out. But ultimately people will end up FOMOing in for better or for worse. And 
they don't want to miss out and, and then it'll continue. It'll eventually just run away and because fiat is a runaway train that's not getting stopped anytime soon, as is Bitcoin. They're going to crash into each other and because one of those runaway trains is infinitely devalued and one of them is infinitely more valued over time, then the one that's more valued over time is just going to logically win. And that's the train that's going to continue to run and people are going to hop on and some people won't and they'll go to gold and whatever, you know, people will face the consequences of their market decisions as is the case with economies for centuries and thousands of years, but it's not going to happen overnight as we've talked about. And it's not going to reach a hundred percent even in the next 30 years. It'll take a long That's in interesting. I also think that the major adoption, if we want it or not, will come to, because big institutional people and countries will come in and then price will rise. And then all of a sudden the retail guys is like, yeah. Oh shit, it's a hundred thousand, 200,000. Uh, now I have to get in. Uh, and, uh, I had like Rajat Sony on and he said something really interesting. That's the, till then stuck in my head. He said like, um, even if we had 1 million US dollar per coin, 90% mm -hmm. of Bitcoin, 90% of people will still not adopt a Bitcoin. 90% of people will still be in, in a fiat world because they will still say the same shit they are saying since like one year or, uh, and, uh, it's like, yeah, I, I, I believe that. Like, I, like what, what, what's the price point when they, uh, start like wondering themselves, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. It what is definitely true is that across each market cycle with Bitcoin, each halving cycle, so every four years, you get more and more people that become hardcore Bitcoiners, i.e. I'm a single issue voter, all my savings are denominated in Bitcoin, and I would only vote for rent for somebody that appeals to my beliefs. So as price continues to rise, as, as the world discovers the first digitally verifiable, immutable scarce asset, immutably scarce asset, then you're going to continue to see people jump on board and adopt those beliefs of, okay, I want money separated from state. I want all of my payments to be in Bitcoin. I want to receive my salary in Bitcoin. There's a growing number of those people. And as they become louder and louder and louder, then the effect they have is greater and greater and greater, especially in the political space. And that's the one that, for better or for worse, rules over us right now. So it's slowly making its way in. It's slowly infiltrating. As I, as we touched on, it's already being discussed with presidential candidates in the United States, with Trump. He's speaking at Nashville in a few weeks. And you're going to see senators and, and congressmen and women continuing to run on platforms of, I support Bitcoiners and their beliefs, and I support the use of Bitcoin in the States and maybe they don't necessarily understand it fully, but you know, over each cycle, I think that the main point is that you're going to see more and more people become hardcore Bitcoiners and really just Bitcoiners in general that, that see the merit of Bitcoin and see the failures and shortcomings of fiat and how their lives are literally being stolen from them because of the inflationary nature of the U S dollar and all fiat currencies. And so as more and more people wake up, the the adoption number increases and then you're you're just talking about a, a technology getting adopted. That's really cool. Um do you think um uh last one on this topic, uh because it's really interesting for me when I think about right now there's like different kinds of Bitcoiners. There are those who only care about the number grab technology. Yep. Speaking, those are on exchanges, on ETFs, on on those kind of things, which is the the vast majority of people, like the vast majority of Bitcoiners don't have a hardware wallet. I talked with the treasure CEO. He said like 2% roughly of Bitcoin holders have a hardware wallet themselves. Do you think that, uh, like that, that the whole world will benefit from Bitcoin or is it only those people who actually get Bitcoin and the properties of Bitcoin and what Bitcoin will actually do for, for you personally? I think absolutely the whole world benefits from it. Even if you don't hold it, money being separated from state in that you don't have a central banker or a politician or a government able to 
obliterate your life savings at the stroke of a pen. I mean, that's huge for yourself, even if you don't own the thing. Of course, what would you own in that sense? If you want to participate in an economy where money is separated from state, that's a whole another topic. But I think I think all of humanity has to benefit from it because the main problem with money over time is its centralization in that people can control and manipulate it, create it, whatever. Whether it's rye stones, whether it's agribeads in Africa, there's plenty of stories that we could go through, but the core value with Bitcoin is that no one is able to manipulate it. No one's able to create it. No one's able to debase your life savings that you've rightfully earned and no one can take it from you. It can't be censored. It's permissionless and that you don't need to go to a government or a bank to sign off on you joining the network. You can just go and pay somebody. And so it helps everybody. Again, if, of course, it helps you more if you own. If you own the thing and you participate, logically, it's like how much does an iPhone do for you if you don't own an iPhone? But I think it still benefits people because it separates money from state. Perfect. Really cool. Uh, I love that thought a lot that it will benefit. Like even the last person that comes in and even the last person yeah. that kind of is on that, like it benefits from from the social thing and, and from everything uh, and from the monetary aspect. Yeah. How was actually your your journey into Bitcoin? How did you come in and, and what are you currently doing in Bitcoin? Yeah, my journey is from the investing realm. I got into equities in the stock market in August 2020, shortly after they printed trillions of dollars. So it was quite lucrative and the ultimate case of beginner's luck. And then I rode that way for about five or six months until start of 2021 when I heard about crypto from a friend. And I started looking into it and really just sent some money into Bitcoin, not really knowing what it was purely for the number go up technology. And I held it for two weeks and I was sweating my balls off the entire time. Because I had no idea what I was holding. I was, I was just hoping it would go up. So anytime it went down, I would scare, I would, I would get scared, which is the case as these bull markets happen, which leads to volatility, but that's another topic. So I held that Bitcoin for two weeks. I made a little bit of profit on it. I bought it in at like 48,000. I think it uh, was the price for one Bitcoin and I sold when it was about 55,000. Then I moved into an altcoin called Theta Token. And rode that way for a little bit, rode, rode kind of the bull market. And then I invested at the end of the year in a crypto DeFi project called Olympus DAO 3.3, which was basically dog water. <laughs> so I, I put my money in dog water and, you know, anybody that's drank dog water knows it doesn't taste very good. It's not good for your body. So, <laughs> so I quickly lost some money and realized. I was playing the whole investment game completely incorrectly, not optimally. So I reset, went back to square one and just reevaluated my entire investment strategy, sold everything in the market, went straight to cash and just started looking and analyzing at all of the different monetary investment asset and investment assets out there. Stocks, bonds, artwork, cars, gold, crypto. Bitcoin. And I came across this guy's model on Twitter. His account is DeFi underscore initiate. And he posted this model built around the halving cycle. And that's really what put me on to Bitcoin and started. That's really what made me ask the first question about it. And once you ask the first question, that's your first step. And you, you really never come back. But my first question is, why does Bitcoin appreciate in these four-year intervals right after this whatever the halving is 2013 bull market, 2017 bull market, 2021 bull market. Okay. Why is that? And then 2014 bear market, 2018 bear market. And then it was February, March, 2022. And it had already kind of drifted that way into 2022 being another bear market. I was like, shoot, this, there might be something here. So I continued to look more and more into it. And, and that kind of 2022 four year having cycle type of thesis continued to play out over the year. And obviously it kind of reached a peak with FTX going under, which is right around the time when I read the Bitcoin standard in the fall of that year. And that was, that was my orange pill moment. 
where I realized what money was and the significance of Bitcoin as the hardest money in the universe and how it was basically a runaway train because of that hard money property. And because of course it's secured as well through its decentralized nature among other things. But then that led me to ask even more questions. And I hopped on Bitcoin Twitter and started following more and more people, started reading more books, listening to podcasts. And I was so far down the rabbit hole, even a a year and a half ago, and I'm infinitely further down it now. But that's kind of how I got into it, was realizing this is the best place to put my money, period. But now you're also um, working in Bitcoin or doing something in Bitcoin? Yeah, right. The second part of your question. Yes. So I'm on Bitcoin Twitter and writing and I have a newsletter and producing content on there. And then I'm writing a book as well called The Bitcoin Thesis, about 60% done. And that's, it's almost a book for myself in the sense of, I wish this was the book that I had right when I got into investing when I was 18 or even anybody that's first getting into the question of what is Bitcoin, this is the book that I would want them to have. This is the book that I would want to have at that, at that point. And it's also a great way to teach as well. Great way to learn. Sorry, because the best way to learn is to teach. So writing is a great way to encode information into your brain. And so doing this research paper thesis book process has helped me learn immensely about Bitcoin and fiat free market economics etc cetera, etc cetera. and even you know the book gets into some things like the rise of hitler and how that's actually connected to central banking and the removal of the uh, gold standard and how that had a trickle down effect which led to again hitler rising to power which really isn't discussed all that often and it's quite significant if that is true that it stems from a monetary issue that's still in place today uh but yeah and then i I'm running an investment fund right now as well that's built around Bitcoin, of course. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order, plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. Really cool i I love the um i'm i'm myself like i'm I'm writing artic uh i'm writing articles for me and uh, i might turn it into book i don't know if if uh, if if there's enough coming because i kind of want to get all the thoughts that i get from the podcast and like just clean it out from myself because i get Mm -hmm. asked when i'm a guest on a podcast like oh what are your favorite takeaways from the podcast and stuff like that and i have like 20,000 answers in my head and I cannot figure out what's the best one. And that's why I kind of just like want to clean my head and then want to research like what has been said on the podcast and yeah. order it, everything. So I think writing is, is amazing for your own brain and for your own thoughts. Um, what did you learn about Bitcoin while, while writing the book? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a huge question, but it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Again, there's 20,000 different answers that can pop up, of course. But I think just... Writing about it for me, I felt it basically poured out of me in the sense that I was filled up so positively with Bitcoin and what it could do. And I had so many questions about it and so many things that I wanted to learn about it that I couldn't just keep it within myself. And I had to actually express it in some capacity. And the book writing and me going on Twitter, coincidental and timing. And it's a great way just to explore and you kind of answer the questions for yourself. And I find that's a great way to write is to write so that you understand it yourself and you're kind of writing for an audience of one, which is yourself. And when you understand it, then you're, you're teaching yourself and that's a great way to do that. 
what's one thing that I've learned from Bitcoin? I learned about the IMF and the, and the World Bank for the first time and how just savagely disgusting those organizations are and the global extraction process that they perform to the global south and, and all of the disgusting effects that stem from that. That was something that really opened my eyes, especially the work of Alex Gladstein. He's just fantastic on the subject. And it was something that I heard a little bit about on Bitcoin Twitter, but never really uh, dove too deep into. And once I did, it was, it's about as sickening as anything I've ever looked into. Sorry, I just got a, forgot my phone to turn off. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting topic. And, uh, it, for me, it's also like, um, we, we talk in Bitcoin off, not like so much about the future. Like mm -hmm. I had a podcast episode where we talked about how we mine a Mercury and, and, and use, use like the, the sun's energy to you to really <laughs> get Bitcoin mining going and, and get Bitcoin across space and stuff like that. But I'm not, then I'm like, we have a lot of problems on the earth. Like <laughs> let's, let's, let's clean up first here, uh, before we think about, uh, going to, to, to other planets. Just quickly on, on that, uh, uh topic on that, uh, and that, uh, IMF topic. W what is the, um, for people that don't know about it, who did mm -hmm. not research about it, um, what is a good way to get in this topic? Uh, and why should we talk about that? Can you hear that by the way in the background? I, little, yeah, but it's, uh, it, 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 is it a right phone there? or? Yeah, there's a, there's a landline at the property I'm at right now, which is, I mean, it's like finding a dinosaur, but. Oh, it's nice landline because we yeah, talked before about that landline. There you go. Yeah. Cell phone. It, uh, it's still there. Like, it's also in Austria. Moment. Like, landlines are, are still a thing in Austria. Um, but less and less. For example, I have in, in my apartment no, no landline, but I know my grandma still has a landline. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, and mm -hmm. there are even some new houses. They just wanted to have a landline because it was available <laughs> there and they, they just put it in. Right. It's like a, a house phone that's always reachable. Uh, um, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's something interesting, but I think like now it's like 0 0.01% or something like that. It's still there and it, it, it will be extinct at some point, probably. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, like I said, it's already becoming more and more antiquated. And even being here, I've never picked up the phone once. But it is it is quite interesting. It's a full circle moment, as we talked about at the start. But to answer your question about the IMF, I would say if you really want to research it, look into the work of Alex Gladstein. And he has a couple of great articles on Bitcoin Magazine, as well as a book, at least one book that he's written. Dive deep there. Or wait for the book to be published. Uh, but other than that, I am going to be posting some content soon about it on Twitter as well, because the world needs to understand what's going on there. Because right now that I think the majority of people view these organizations as global aid, and what Richard Nixon said is let us remind ourselves that the purpose of aid is not to help others, but to help ourselves. Of course, Richard Nixon was the U S president that, changed the Bretton Woods gold standard to the full-fledged fiat standard, the one that formed the monetary system that we have today. And he was the one that said the quiet part out loud and that these global economic aid organizations are not helping others. They are really extracting resources from these other countries and bringing it to the developed, nation, developed nations. And so what's happening is the developing countries are actually developing the developed countries not the other way around. oh man that's that's um some some deep truths right there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think it would uh, completely um flipped out like four years ago when i would have heard that uh but now i'm like yeah it makes to total sense like it's uh, even if you look at like history of money you, like um there was this time where like europeans already figured out and they were already kind of on a gold standard uh, the Africans not, and then like, when, when you have not the global reserve currency, when you don't have the, the best monetary standard, the, uh, your value will be extracted. And especially with the US right now, it's like 66 countries or something like that outside of the US have the US as, as currency. 
And it's it's a massive good business model. They can print money. Yeah. Of course, they also have inflation in their own country, but they can export the inflation uh, and and export it in other countries. That's like uh, it. It's it almost seems unreal when you really think about what's going on with fiat, and then you think about like how many people charge Bitcoin as like a pyramid scheme or like a <laughs> uh, so, some something weird, and then you're like, no, but. Everything else is kind of a pyramid scheme. It's kind of like this. This yeah. And the further and further you get down into it, the more obvious it becomes. It's just that most people don't even bother asking the questions or looking further into it past what they hear from oftentimes mainstream media. And so, you know, a quote that I like is, "Forget what they tell you. If you want the truth, follow the money." Because that, that's where the truth lies. And if you follow the money in the IMF, you'll see that these countries, for every dollar of quote unquote aid that goes into countries, on average, $14 comes out of those countries. And so they're just getting, they're just getting their resources extracted from them. No different than when West Africans had their resources extracted from them in the 15th and 16th century with European settlers coming in and printing agri beads and enslaving them because They had all the power, the monetary power. And that is, that is the greatest power for better or for worse is monetary power because that's what underpins society, our economy. And so when you have the ability to print money at will and thrust it upon people and enslave them with debt, which is what I get into in the book and what Alex Gladstein does a really good job of covering, then they become enslaved and then they have to abide by your terms, your standards. And so what often come, what often happens is the IMF will give terms to one of these countries and you'll start to see multinational corporations from developed countries come in and they'll start building roads. But what would those roads lead to? They'll lead to mines for scarce resources, platinum, copper, whatever it is. And they'll go in and extract those resources and then they'll send them out to the developed countries at lower cost because they've debased the currency in the process by enslaving them with debt that they have to pay back with more money. It's, it's a whole, it's a really sick cycle is what it is. Do you think that, um, coming, coming back to, to this social aspect and this fairness, this global fairness that, which is not there yet, uh, is not there now. Um, do you think this will be the most impact, impactful thing that Bitcoin will bring as a change to, Uh, the world uh, as because when you have like actual global money with, with Bitcoin, nobody can manipulate it. Of course, there are people that have more Bitcoin, there are bigger counters, there are smaller counters and all that things. But um, will this will this be the, the biggest change that Bitcoin will bring besides the monetary aspect? This being the, what, what specifically do you I, mean? I mean, the, Like when we talk about the IMF and extracting other countries and yeah. basically enslaving them, when we when you get one dollar in and fourteen out, uh, that's kind of like uh, a, a enslavement for me. Um, and will Bitcoin stop this? And will this be the the most impactful thing on a on a global scale, not just like getting good money? Yeah, I think that when I discuss the IMF and the World Bank in the book is in a chapter called "Why Bitcoin Matters" and why Bitcoin matters in one word is freedom. And when you are enslaved by a central bank or a government, as all U.S. citizens are that hold U.S. dollars, for better or for worse, much less people out in West Africa or Bangladesh that are bold into the structural adjustment terms of the IMF and the World Bank. The fact is that anybody that owns money and earns money and has to pay taxes in money that can be manipulated and debased at will by a select group of elites You are, you are enslaved by those people because they control your life savings as they please. You have no say in the matter. It's not democratic. And so it's not just the IMF people or the IMF developing countries that are enslaving, even though it's much worse than those cases. It's everyone that's under central banking and fiat currencies that hold money, earn money and pay taxes in money that can be debased to oblivion just because the central bank says, Oh, that's, that's what we should do. We'll, we'll print six trillion dollars in stimulus because we feel like it. And there's no, there's no, 
democratic vote across the country. And so what what Bitcoin does is it breaks the chain between central banks and citizens and it frees citizens as a result because with Bitcoin, nobody can control the system. Nobody can manipulate it. Nobody can create new Bitcoins at will. There's not a select corporation or government or group of elites, bankers, politicians, whatever it is that can control the system. And that's the entire idea with Bitcoin. And that's the entire problem with money over the course of humanity is it's controlled by centralized powers. And that's why it's so significant. And that's why Bitcoin frees the world. And that's why Bitcoin matters because it frees the world because it solves the problem of centralization. So now we have a decentralized money that nobody can use. It can be sent in instantly anywhere in the world. It can be divided down smaller than a penny and it can never be inflated past 21 million, which means 21 million Bitcoins, which means your value can never be debased, which is what happens when monetary currencies are inflated. Your money gets devalued as a result. So now you're talking about a monetary standard that can be used across the globe everywhere that everyone can unite on, that everyone can adopt as a standard measurement of value in that, okay, a cow is worth, or let's say a pound of beef is worth half a Bitcoin in the United States and is worth a quarter of the Bitcoin in, in Australia. Well, then what you would see happen is by the nature of the free market, because cow producers can earn more for their beef in the United States, they'd ship more beef out there. And because supply would increase there, then the demand to supply relationship would fall and the price would fall as a result. And so you'd reach this kind of collective global equilibrium to where price would fall there. And then you're talking about the free market being unleashed because we're, because we're united on free money. We're united on a standard measurement of value that can never be manipulated. And that can be understood anywhere in the world on a global digital immutable level. And that's protected from any manipulation or centralized evil authorities. I love that a lot. I, I had one thought in my mind when you were speaking. Um, yeah. Do you think it's a possibility, short and medium term, maybe even long term, that central banks figure out that they need Bitcoin as BlackRock figured out that they need Bitcoin as Trump mm -hmm. figured out that he needs Bitcoin, that they are just starting to buy them and, and try to back fiat currencies to a certain amount with Bitcoin and therefore kind of save fiat currencies? Right. I think that that thought goes through my mind a good bit. And it's certainly a possibility in the infinite range of outcomes. I think like, what's the point of doing that though is, okay, are they going to save fiat so that they can still then manipulate the U S dollar? Because that's the only point of having the US dollar for central banks is because they can manipulate it and change interest rates and try to affect the economy, which enriches those at the top. Well, if you back it by a certain amount of Bitcoin, well, then you can't do what central banking is designed to do. So then you're completely eradicated the point of Bitcoin, unless then you change the, the fixed exchange rate, which then you're just manipulating currency. And we're back at the same problem again, which would then say, well, let's just get rid of fiat currencies altogether, which is what we're doing right now. So there's, it doesn't, it's kind of antithetical to adopt for a central bank to adopt Bitcoin. And you could have it in your reserves, but then it, are you still able to manipulate money that's backing it? And again, it goes back to what I just talked about. You either can have a fixed exchange rate, which then there's no need for a central bank, or you have a non-fixed exchange rate, which means we should get rid of the central bank because they can manipulate money. So that, that's, that's how I like to think of it. I think that's the, uh, the simplest solutions uh, and the, the, the simplest explanation of that that I ever heard. Really cool. <laughs> I loved how you, how you put it. Um, before we get to the end routine and before we, uh, uh, come to the closer end to the podcast, um, how do you see a AI coming into this thing, like AI impacting or maybe even integrating with, with Bitcoin? It's like for me, like, when, when, when AI with all the information out there, which, which money will it choose? <laughs> uh, yeah. For me, it's pretty obvious. Like, how, how do you see that uh, whole thing with AI and, and Bitcoin, the integration and the uh, impacting? Yeah, I'm certainly not the most technical computer programmer person. So I, I probably wouldn't be the best person uh, on this subject, but I think AI is much as 
I'm sure you've come to the conclusion, would choose Bitcoin because it's permissionless, right? They don't have to go to a bank to sign up to use it. It's instantly sendable and it's verifiable. So, you know, in an AI pays an AI, we can see it. We can understand that Bitcoins have been sent from one place to another, from one address to another. And you don't need to be an actual person to have an address. You can be in a quote unquote AI. You can be a form of artificial intelligence that just communicates with each other. And I think that really starts diving into the the futuristic brilliance of Bitcoin. And we're kind of just really getting to the edge of that water. Hmm. Interesting. Um before we start to the end routine, um, I have one question that I always ask my, my guests, uh, before the end to the, the aim of the question is like kind of getting something else outside of Bitcoin, outside of money and outside of those topics in. Um, so what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Yeah, great, great question. Something I very much plan on talking about on Twitter, especially is this movement system that I often say and do say and would say and will say that is the only thing that I would put in the same tier as Bitcoin in terms of priceless information that I've learned. And to put anything in that tier with Bitcoin is astronomically significant for me. And so what, I, what I've learned, and it was about two years ago now, is this mood, movement system called GOTA. And it's spelled G-O-A-T-A. They don't do a great job of advertising it or marketing it online. And, and, uh, there's some things down the line that I have visions about, but essentially there's a movement pattern of injury and there's a movement pattern of security and durability. So these people at Goda, they looked at four different tribes of humans and analyzed them. They looked at newborn babies straight out of the womb. They looked at multi-decade athletes with little to no injuries. They're Tom Brady's or Michael Jordan's, Ed Reed's. Then they looked at untouched indigenous tribes all across the world that have been basically unaffected by modern society and the lifestyles that come with that. And then they looked at basically centennial athletes like your Ida Keelings, Hur Hurricane Hawkins that are, for example, Ida Killian is a 105-year-old track athlete, and she's still running pain-free, and she loves every minute. So they looked into all of these groups of people, and they started asking questions, well, why? What commonalities do they have? And so they found there's actually a pattern of movement that actually aligns with nature. Because if you look at all forms of natural energetic movement, think of a hurricane, think of a tornado, Think of sacred geometry. Think of a galaxy like the Milky Way. They all come in what? They all spiral. They all have these spirals to them. So they move around this center force and they spiral around them. And they found that all four of these groups had those same spiral-like patterns. And it's really difficult to talk about over a podcast. Visuals is really the best way to describe it. But then they looked at the other side and they said, okay, what's going on when we tear an ACL? What goes on when we rupture an Achilles? Why is plantar fasciitis a thing? Why do we have low back pain? And so the, then they started getting further into the weeds and they found there are patterns in movement there as well, where every single non-contact ACL shred happens because the foot collapses and the arch that supports the foot collapses. And then the pressure gets thrown up the chain into the knee. And because you're, you know, very few people tear their ACLs when walking, but it happens a lot in football players with cuts, right? That's a lot of force being driven into the ground. So when your arch collapses, all that force gets driven up into the knee and then your ACL takes the brunt of that force as it's not designed to, and then it tears. But the idea there is that the, our feet are our foundations for movement through time and space, and specifically the arches in our feet. Arches in and of themselves are weight-bearing structures, right? An arch, you would never support an arch with another weight or another structure. That's antithetical to what an arch is. But yet we have arch support shoes, right? So anytime we 
collapse the arch, which happens when our foot splays out from that straight position. Think about it like two columns, your feet and your knees, your hips, shoulders, all the way up. There are two columns on both sides of your body. If your feet are straight, those columns are in their position. If you splay your feet out like a duck, imagine the bottom of that column going outward and the other column going outward. Well, then everything above that column would just collapse under it because there's nothing supporting it. So when you splay your feet, you're collapsing your arch and all of that weight gets thrown up to your lower back, to your hip, to your knee, to your spine, to your neck, whatever it is. And then those things that are not designed to absorb and load energy and force, then they start atrophying, they start seeing chronic pain issues. And so there's a long winded answer, but essentially they, they advocate for straight feet and the strengthening of arches, not using, not using modern day shoes, right? Barefoot shoes. For me, for example, I had flat feet growing up and I started wearing barefoot shoes. I, retrained to become a uh, go to mover and now i have arches in both of my feet which sounds it's almost backwards why would not having anything supporting my arches help me build an arch well it's because i'm actually strengthening the muscle and consistently developing it in the pattern as i was designed to move so what's significant with goat is that is they discover that every single human being and animal every single wild animal moves the same as every single newborn human they all have this same pattern of movement, but we get codified into this Woda realm through three things. We get codified through the shoes that we wear that constrict our toe boxes, support our arches, heels raised backwards through the way that we sit in modern day chairs, which it's almost like peeing in a urinal where your, your pelvis and your hips get tucked forward and you sit in this front chain dominant which then pushes, which externally rotates your hips, which then what happens there is your femur gets externally rotated and then your hips and then your feet have to splay as a result. And then you get arch collapses and then the force comes right up the chain as well. And then the third is the way that we train. So anything that trains in that front chain dominant that pushes the hips forward and splays the feet out, think of like a, an Olympic squat or a deadlift. With those feet splay, they're wide outside of the columns. Anytime you're outside of the columns, you're driving force up the chain as it should not be. So they found that all newborn human beings move GOTA, but we get WOTA-fied by modern lifestyle. And so we have to retrain, become GOTA again to rediscover our true nature in line with how nature designed us to move, how nature designed everything to move. Again, if you look at wild animals like tigers, lions, dogs, cats they all move in this go to pattern they all move the same way and that's how we're supposed to move as well and so when we move backward this is when low back pain becomes an issue this is why hip and knee replacements are up 125 and 150 percent over the last 15 years it's because we're continuing to adopt these modern ways of living that are backwards to how we're designed to move and exist through time and space and so we're suffering as a result so i'm glad you asked and there's much more to the go to thing and there's visuals that help explain, but that's certainly something that I really feel called to share and express online and help people with. And there's actually somebody right now that I'm helping to recode into becoming Goda and live and exist pain free because that's a birthright and being able to live and exist and move pain free is as priceless as anything. Amazing. How is it uh, spelled again? G O A T A. Oh, amazing. Uh, I, I will, I will look it up. Maybe put some, some resources in, in, in the description. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can send me some, some articles or books or something like that. If, if someone wants to check it out and, and go deeper. Um, it, this sounds, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I had a, I had a Twitter space with another Bitcoiner. Um, and he like just randomly had a story about Bitcoin and then he, talked about on, on an adventure in his thought train, uh, that he always runs without shoes. Like he just runs mm. barefoot all the time. And I'm like, how do you do like, and how, do, <laughs> how do you do that? And he's like, how do you do it with shoes? Like they're, they are really bad for you. And I'm yeah. like, okay, interesting. Uh, and, uh, I've, I've seen more and more, uh, Bitcoin, I like Bitcoin. Um, there's like small Bitcoin conferences. 
like in a hotel with like 50, 100 people. Mm -hmm. uh, I see there are more and more people like they're just going outside with barefoot or with just socks or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, a Bitcoin thing going back to, to, to the roots where, and, and, and don't manipulate the, the nature too much. I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what Bitcoin is all about. Like leaving nature as it is and don't in uh, on don't manipulate things with the human hand yeah i like to say that fiat is to bitcoin as woda is to goda and bitcoin is goda and goda is bitcoin they're abiding by the laws of nature the laws of physics the laws of energy and that's why they work and that's why they're solutions Amazing. Perfect. Then let's come to our end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and it's an, it's an very wide, wide, uh, and, 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 uh, cool question today. And <laughs> never, for some reason was never on the, on the show, uh, before. Um, what is your meaning of life? To be alive. <laughs> that that is, alive. yeah, I think that is the meaning of life is to be alive, right? If you're not alive, then you're dead and there is no life. So there's, there's many things that go into that, right? Like what brings you life, what makes you feel alive and to do those things. But to me, it is to be alive. Perfect. Then, uh, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Cole underscore Walmsley. And that's pretty much it as of now. But yeah, that's, uh, and then I have my sub stack that's on there and, uh, my website as well. So yeah, check me out on there. Perfect. And yeah, thank you, Cole, for being on. Thank you for joining us today. Also for everyone listening and watching. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robin. Bye -bye.